Tracy Watts. Welcome to Mercer Health News. My guests today are Kate Brown. Kate leads our Center for Health Innovation. Welcome, Kate. Hi, Tracy. Thanks for having me. And we're also joined by Sam Espinosa, and Sam leads our Government Healthcare Services Group. Thanks for being here, Sam. Thank you so much, Tracy. Thrilled to be here. Our goal for the next few minutes is to share some exciting work that is going on in both the commercial and government sector focused on virtual first care. So to start, Kate, will you please provide just some baseline information on the concept of virtual first care? You know, just what exactly is it? Yeah, happy to start, Tracy. Um, so earlier this year, the American Telemedicine Association and the Digital Medicine Society formed an is industry group called Impact. And the first order of business for that group was to define what virtual first care is. So very briefly, virtual first care is medical care for individuals or a community that's accessed through digital interactions where possible, guided by a clinician, and integrated into a person's everyday life. So if you think about that definition, it's really much more than just telemedicine. This is something that can apply to primary care, specialty care, chronic condition management, as well as remote care delivery. And we really think that virtual first care is going to change the way that individuals consume healthcare, and also it's going to fundamentally transform today's healthcare model. It's exciting stuff. Well, and you know, it's so badly needed. I think, you know, Mercer has documented as well as other sources, the projected shortage of physicians, you know, as soon as five years out. So this seems like it could definitely help bridge that gap in access. And so Sam, how much do you see the value first care strategy in place in the government sector? Well, it's interesting, Tracy, pre pandemic, I would say very limited use. We, did, we saw one survey where only 8% of Medicaid patients had used a virtual first care model in 2019. And fast forward today, we're seeing a very rapid expansion across the country uh, in our Medicaid clientele for virtual first care, really fueled uh, in addition to demand and the challenging COVID environment by federal, state, and financing advantages, uh, new provider types and modalities that are now available, and then the waiving of penalties such as HIPAA. Um, we're specifically, we're seeing it manifest uh, as we try and increase access in this COVID environment with social distancing, um, respecting that high, high and complex patients need ongoing care in the COVID world we live in, and really starting to expand the experimentation with behavioral health, virtual first care models, and long-term service and support for home and community-based service virtual first care models. Um, so that's a lot of different potential touch points in the, uh, in the, in the public sector, the Medicaid market. Um, so let's go a little bit deeper on this. So Kate, as you're working through these opportunities with clients, what is the process that a plan sponsor should go through to be able to take advantage of virtual first care? Yeah, well, you're right, Tracy, and certainly the complexity that Sam just described on the public side, I think, is mirrored on the commercial side as well. There are a lot of opportunities for virtual first care, right? So if you think back to that definition, it's not just about one line of service and one vendor that perhaps you implement. It really could disrupt everything that you're doing with your health and benefits strategy. And so I think to your question, Tracy, about how do employers get started and how do they start to think about this? Um, you know, first up, I think, is really to evaluate how virtual first care fits into your current benefit strategy, whether that's an enhancement or a total evolution of where you are today. Um, now, for many employers, they're probably already deploying virtual first care in some form or fashion, right? Many employers offer telemedicine upwards of 90%. Um, but we also see digital health companies being offered through the employer channel. So if you have a diabetes solution or a cardiovascular solution where care is being delivered virtually, guess what? That also counts as V1C. So maybe you could pat yourself on the back and say you've got some of these elements already. Um, but in many cases, there is an opportunity really to um, both adopt or adapt your V1C strategy in choosing partners that are really mindful of what measurements they can have as part of the impact of their program, and also how they can integrate with other virtual care and brick and mortar providers in your benefit system. Um, when selecting sort of any virtual first service, I think that it's really important to think about 
partners that are striving for constant improvement, right? This medium of care delivery being virtual is relatively new. And obviously the uptake in it throughout the COVID pandemic and hopefully going forward, everybody's continuing to learn. So think about that when you choose your partners, um, look for those that are striving for that constant improvement. And finally, I would say that really employers should be pushing vendors to demonstrate how their solutions impact total cost of care. And that's kind of a big, scary problem, I think, for a lot of vendors and a lot of employers today, but something that we should be pushing for. So, you know, that's interesting, Kate. I think that during the pandemic, we did see, you know, of course, a spike in the use of virtual care with um, one's, you know, primary care physician. And, um, I don't know if we really know if that was cost effective or not, but I think the one thing that we did see was just how varied the um, provider acceptance was of providing care this way. Do you see that as a barrier and what do you think the time horizon is for carriers to really get on board with, with that kind of a strategy in terms of seeing their patients that way? Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's a bit of a, an unknown at this point. Um, and certainly the reimbursement changes during COVID. You're right, Tracy, we don't know exactly what the cost picture will shake out to be. But certainly that's a big open question for virtual care going forward is how do we reimburse for it relative to in-person services? So certainly a big open question there. Um, but to your question of sort of how do we solve for providers who are maybe hesitant about engaging in this channel, um, I think that there's probably a fair amount of education that needs to happen on both the provider and the patient side of things to understand when virtual pathways are appropriate versus not, because you can't solve everything via virtual channel, and I don't think anybody would argue that you can, but I think there is a lot of efficiency that can be realized through this channel, and that's really going to be some change management probably on the behalf of both providers and patients. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, there's a reason why it's called an annual physical examination. Um, and, you know, perhaps that will change, who knows. Um, but, you know, thinking about that and those challenges, Sam, what has the process been within the public sector? And are there things that you would have changed now that you've been through some of this? You know, what what has your experience been with taking advantage of types of virtual first care? Of course, Tracy, of course, it's a great question. Um, I think for the public sector purchaser, I think the first place is to land is what is what is the relevance of virtual first care for them? Some states have said this is, you know, a solution for historical access problems in Medicaid that have been uh, challenged since Medicaid began in 1965. Others see it as a potential risk with new, new uh, exposures for fraud, waste, and abuse present. And so it needs to be managed carefully. So I think first is to land on a point of view. What is the relevance of virtual first care for you, for your state, for your political environment? Then once you've landed on that, there's a host of technical challenges that states are faced with. Uh, service definitions, coding rules, payment rates, uh, incorporating virtual first care into a host of other strategies that we have going on right now, like value-based purchasing, uh, mental health parity. Um, and so once you've got that plan laid out, then the state purchaser needs to really proceed onward and come up with a very thoughtful measurement and assessment methodology prior to jumping in so they know how they're going to be um, evaluating the success of this program and achieving the goals or not. Uh, if I was to kind of reverse time and start over, I think I would have began with more energy spent on assessment and methodology, but the, the pandemic took us all a bit by surprise. And so we've sort of got into this as, we, as best we can. Yeah, that's really interesting. I guess what, what I take away from that is that there really is a lot of, you know, wiring, if you will, that has to happen so that all of these pieces fit together the way that they need to. Um, you know what I think would be great is if you both would share some examples of how this is working today. And so, Kate, will you go first and share an example or two? Yeah, um, a couple come to mind in the commercial space. So, um, first up, we've seen virtual first care layered on top of on-site clinic models. So many employers who had on-site or near-site in place before the pandemic suddenly had a clinic space that they weren't able to use while everybody was in lockdown. And so a lot of vendors in that space really broke into the virtual care 
um, realm during the pandemic and have thus adjusted their product roadmaps to keep virtual first care as the first pathway into care. Um, really that happens in terms of triaging uh, via the virtual channel and then being paired with that brick and mortar clinic. Um, so that's one example, Tracy. Another that we've seen a huge uptick in during COVID is virtually delivered behavioral health care. So Sam mentioned that's increased for the Medicaid services as well, but certainly we've seen that in the commercial space. Um, and then finally, we're starting to see a lot of vertically integrated virtual first care models coming to market. Um, so there have been some recent carrier announcements about virtual first health plans. We've seen a lot of acquisitions and partnerships coming together to really make virtual care more of a longitudinal pathway. So if you think about the merger of Livongo and Teladoc, for example, or the recent announcement of Grand Rounds rebranding into the Included Health um, company that includes both Doctor On Demand as well as Included Health, again, with that virtual first care component front and center. Good. Sam, what about examples in your space? Um, well, one example would be follow-up care, behavioral health or physical health care, where you've already met with the primary care or treating physician, and now you can do uh, less intense follow-up visits with that provider through a virtual model. Um, another one can be behavioral health care, as we've talked about a few times on this chat, uh, whether that's individual behavioral health, small group behavioral health, or even opioid use disorder patients are finding uh, models available to them as a virtual model. Uh, and then finally, a real good one for Medicaid is creating access for transportation as a barrier. Transportation has been a challenge for many Medicaid members, you know, historically. Uh, and it doesn't just rural or remote clients, but it's patients that could be in an inner city but can't leave the home, perhaps even a COVID-infected patient that is quarantined. And so this has been able to create access in all these types of challenges that historically have been difficult for the Medicaid client. So your examples really highlight the opportunity to use this to, to meet somebody where they are. Um, your last example really wasn't about their health status. It was more about them needing to get to care and how could this, this, this help bridge that gap. And so I think that's kind of a, an interesting way for us to all think about that expanded role of healthcare and um, how we might support it. Um, you know, I don't want to sound like a skeptic, but we see a lot of shiny new objects in healthcare that we all get very excited about. And so my next question for both of you is what needs to happen to ensure that the V1C fulfills the promises under which it was conceived? And so, Sam, why don't you go first? Sure. It's a great question. My team is often asked uh, by our clients to evaluate success or failure on both a programmatic or financial outcome for many programs. And um, I think one of the things we commonly want to start with is really a value proposition from the consumer. That's the person or individual that has to engage in the change. And so we want to sit down and be thoughtful and say, what's in it for them? What's going to motivate them to engage with this new program? Um, as you've heard me speak previously, evaluation and measurement need to come into that early thinking. And I like to talk to clients about what I would call, you know, click down metrics, not only did I save money? But then if I click down, why did I save money? What could be the things I'm going to want to ask about that metric to that'll really fuel insight into it? So thinking a little bit deeper than the immediate um, metric itself, but what are supporting metrics that might get me there? And then finally, you know, I think we're in an age now where things are moving so quickly, Tracy, that we really sort of need to start thinking about real-time monitoring and program evolution and not just waiting for like an annual cycle to take place and then try again with a new version. We need to start getting data as we're going into these changes and making tweaks along the way and communicating about those tweaks to members uh, as we're learning real time. You know, I, I just got an Apple uh, update on my phone and a day later I got a new one and a day later I got a new one. And so I'd like to see healthcare continue to evolve to that kind of model where we're tinkering with it as we get smarter and not just waiting for a break in the process. That is um, some really good advice. Kate, what about you? Yeah, so I, I definitely agree that starting with what the consumer is looking for is, is a good place to think about. Um, you know, I think that there's a risk that virtual first care across the spectrum could further fragment the patient experience and drive up costs. And frankly, that's the exact opposite of what employers, Medicaid administrators, and consumers want, right? Um, so in order to ensure that that doesn't happen, I think that we really need to push the market to structure the pricing and reimbursement for virtual first services 
in a way that aligns with the goals of managing costs and ultimately bringing down that total cost of care issue across all players that I mentioned a little bit ago. So I can't let either one of you leave without sharing your advice with our listeners. If they want to embark on a value first care strategy for their population, what is your best advice, Kate? Yeah. So Sam just mentioned that like the real world is iterative, right? It's constantly changing. And as consumers, we're faced with that. And we've certainly adapted in crazy ways during COVID. So my advice is keep that momentum going. Keep experimenting, especially when it comes to virtual first care. All right, Sam, your advice? You know, I like the phrase, be curious, uh, be connected and be careful. And I would say be curious because there are things going on globally with this, this concept right now in this discussion around virtual first care. And so the extent we're taking advantage of the learnings that are occurring across the world, I think we'll all be a little bit better as we, as we step into this and then be connected, you know, engaging in active dialogue with purchasers like yourself or other types of purchasers, again, to avail yourself to their learnings, their insights, their experimentation. And then finally, you've heard me say evaluation and measurement several times in this conversation. Be careful, be thoughtful, you know, jumping in is good when you have to, but if you can take a moment to think it through, you'll find you get better results in the end. So big topic, virtual first care. I have a feeling it's going to be a topic that we will be talking a lot more about. And Kate and Sam, thank you both for joining us today and thank all of you for tuning in. Thank you. Thanks.